and uh, today we're in week three of the series we're calling The Daniel Dilemma. So if you're here with us for the very first time, if you're a guest with us today, um, this is part three of a series. You can go back and watch the rest of them online on our website. You can find them there. But it's a series based on the book of Daniel from Scripture, but we're also using a, a book by Pastor Chris Hodges called The Daniel Dilemma as a great resource. And some of you have bought that. You're reading along um, as, as we uh, go through this series. And the lesson that we're learning, guys, what we're trying to learn through this is how to stand firm and love well. There's two things there. I don't want you to just hear stand firm, right? I want you to hear stand firm and love well in a culture of compromise. That's what we're learning. How do we stand for God's truth and His Word and love people well at the same time in a culture that doesn't believe like we believe, in a culture that doesn't, um, that doesn't act the way we act, a culture that doesn't value many of the things that we value in the Christian faith. And what's happening is culture is bombarding us with the lies of the enemy that we have to behave like them, we have to become like them, we have to believe like them or else. That's, what cult, that's the dilemma that culture is, is giving us. You either do like we do or else. And, and the church has not done a very good job of responding to that. It's, it's been an either-or response. Like either we're going to stand firm, and by God, this is the way it is, and, 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 and all y'all can go to hell if y'all don't believe what we believe out there, right? And the church takes stands like that. This is just the way it's going to be, and you've got you, you, to do it just like this, or, or you're going to burn. And that's, that's one way, and it's not the right way. The other way is we just put our head in the sand, and, and we, won't, we won't really stand on anything. We won't stand for anything because we don't want to offend anybody, and we don't want to make anybody uncomfortable, or we don't, want, we don't want to run people off from the church. We want everybody to be welcome, and that, that, there's a big part of that that's true, but it's not the right response. God calls us to do truth and grace, both together, truth and grace, and we're learning how to do that. Amen? So week one, just recapping for you, if you are a guest with us today, we want you to come back next week for the finale, and in a couple weeks, we're starting a new series about how to leave a legacy. But in week one, we talked about uh, how the culture wants to change our identity, wants to change who we are. And then last week, we talked about how culture wants to change our mentality. There's this Babylon mentality that says uh, it's like a self-righteousness or, or, or like a a, a prideful mentality. And today we're going to talk about how culture wants to lead us to idolatry. And maybe you're, you're thinking, that's a, that's a weird word, idolatry. It's, it's a biblical word, yeah. But idolatry is when you, when, it's, in other words, it's this. It's when you begin to bow down to other things in your life. You begin to put other things before God, things that aren't worthy how many other things in this life are worthy of the praise that we give God? None. There's nothing. But we do it so often. And, and idolatry is trying to get us to worship things that don't deserve our affection and don't deserve our worship. They don't deserve us placing value in those things. That's what idolatry is. So we're going to learn today how to live a stand-up life in a world that's bowing down all around us a world that's bowing down to different, to different beliefs, to different idols. And, and hear me, when I say idol, I'm not talking about a little fat Buddha that sits up on the, the, the shelf at the local um, restaurant. I'm, that's not what I'm talking about. An idol can be anything that you put before God. Anything. It could be the, should I say it? It could be the deer lease. I'm just, I don't know, it could, it, could be, it could be the fitness center. Oh, it could, it, could be, it could be a lot of things. It could, it could be your music. It could be your hobbies. It could be your sports, your athletics, whatever that is. I'm just throwing a few out there, you know, just throwing a few out there. But it could be any of those things. And so what we've got to know is that it, we're all going to have to deal with it. I'll just say it this way. For some of you young ladies, maybe, maybe the compromise comes in on Friday night, Saturday night when you're on the date, 
and you don't you're you don't want to compromise but you, you love him you like him and and you you don't want it to be weird and awkward and so you know it's not right but you're in this dilemma like what do I what do I do how do I handle this for guys maybe it's the water cooler jokes at work that are inappropriate and 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 you it grieves your spirit you know man I shouldn't I shouldn't be in on this but if I leave the guys are going to think I'm weird and I, how do I do this it's a dilemma uh, for for some of you, maybe, maybe it's the gossip session after the workout session. And, and like, I, I, know, I know I shouldn't be talking about her or him this way, but, but, but I don't want to be weird and you're in this dilemma, right? And, and those are just things that we face in life. We're going to face those, those issues. But can I tell you, there are people around the world today, right now, who are losing their lives for the sake of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Their dilemma is a little bit different. Their dilemma is you, you renounce your faith in Jesus Christ or die. That's their dilemma. In fact, I just read an article yesterday where a church in China was bulldozed to the ground by the communist government who said, hey, you're not doing things the way we approve of. So we just bulldoze your church down. And I, I hope those things and those times never come to America. More than likely, we, we may not see that in our lifetime, but can I tell you, uh, America's changing. And there may be a time where you could go to jail for preaching the Word of God in a certain place. Or, or saying certain things that are biblical that could be offensive to other people. And, and today, I, I'm just saying, here's the deal. Compromising situations don't determine who you worship. They reveal what you worship. You can write that in your notes. Compromising situations don't determine who you worship. That, that was settled a long time ago. Uh, they reveal who you worship. Reveals what's going on on the inside and who you worship. And, and worship itself is a heart matter. It's, it's a matter of what's going on, on the inside. Like what matters most to me? Who do I care about most in this life? Who or what gets my devoted allegiance and loyalty? Uh, what's my top priority? Is it all about me, right? Is it all about what I want? Where does all my time, my energy, and my money go? And I've heard one guy say, you show me your, your checkbook, I'll show you what you love, right? Because, because we, we usually put our money where our heart is, where we, the things that we love. And what I'm just getting at today is that we are made to worship. We're made to put God first, to be in relationship with Him. And if we're not worshiping our Creator, then we're putting something else in His rightful position. And, and that is idolatry. That's idolism. That's bowing down and offering our hearts to anything other than our Creator God. It's, it's idol. So, so I want us to do this today. I want to take a look at what the Bible says about standing firm. Talk about standing firm. It's found in 1 Corinthians chapter 16. And it says this. It says, be on your guard. Everybody say these next two words. Stand firm. Stand firm. Stand firm in the faith. Be courageous. Be strong. All of those words right there are like, they're like warrior type words. It's like, it's like battle ready type words. Like be, be on your guard. Like stand firm in the faith. Be courageous. Be strong. And the next one is do everything in love. Do, do what in love? Be on your guard in love. Stand firm in the faith in love. Be courageous in love. Be strong in love. Do whatever you do, do it in love. Do, do you see truth and grace here? Do you see standing firm and loving well here in this passage? That's what I want us to get, where I want us to, to, to grow and where I want us to, to learn. So, Today we're going to talk about, uh, not Daniel, but it's a story in the book of Daniel about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, all right? And we're going to talk about the fiery furnace. Who's ready for that, right? The fiery furnace. Now listen, uh, I'm going to apologize in advance for it being super simple. Um, it's just simple. And, and I try to make it that way on purpose, but it's just simple today. A lot of scripture. I'm going to read through this entire chapter, and it's not all in your notes, but it will be all on the screen. So uh, are you ready? If you're ready, say, here we go. 
Okay, Daniel chapter 3, verse 1 through 7. Let's, let's take a look at that. King Nebuchadnezzar made an image. I want you to notice that word. It's going to show up several times over the next few slides. He made an image of gold 60 cubits high and 6 cubits wide. That is 90 feet tall, 9 feet wide. That's a, that's a big image. That's a, that's a big thing. And he, he set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. And then he summoned the satraps, the prefects, the governors, the advisors, the treasurers, the judges, the magistrates, and all other provincial officials to come to the dedication of the what? The image. The, the first song we sang today says, it said, um, it calls Jesus the image. It, it appears in, uh, oh, we look to the sun, set our eyes on the Savior, see the image of love. So all this is a counterfeit, y'all. This, this is a counterfeit. And so dedication of the image that he had set up. So uh, the provincial officials assembled for the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up, and they stood before it. And I kind of just imagine them standing before it like, you know, like some good old boys, you know, like, man, that thing's huge. Like if it, if it was a statue of Nebuchadnezzar, maybe they're going, Man, look at the detail in his nostrils. That is just, that's incredible, man. The hair on his legs, that's just awesome, right? It's just, they're standing before it. They're, they're checking out this statue, whatever it is, they're checking it out. And then the, the herald, not a man named Harold, but a, a person who was called the herald, loudly proclaimed, nations and peoples of every language, this is what you're commanded to do. As soon as you hear the sound... Of the horn, the flute, the zither, and the lyre. I don't even know what a zither and lyre is, but it sounds pretty mean. I just, I don't know what it is. The harp, the pipe, and all kinds of music. You must fall down and worship the image. You must worship this counterfeit because there's only one image of love. You, you've got to worship the image of gold that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. And, and I'm going to pause here for just a second because I believe that sights and sounds are one of the primary ways that the enemy will lead us into a life of compromise. And you guys know that I'm, I'm not the preacher who gets up here and says, don't do this or you'll burn. Don't do that. I don't preach that way. I like to encourage you. I want you to fall more in love with Jesus because I feel like if you fall in love with Jesus, then all that other stuff, it, it, it won't hang on you, right? But I, I want to stop for a minute and, and just lead you down this path to think with me about the things that you allow in your lives, the images that you may be bowing down to that you don't even realize. It's, it's movies. And, and maybe it's a movie that mocks God, and you think, oh, that's, that's just a movie. It's just Hollywood. But really, really, think about that. It, maybe it's the websites that you go to and the images that you can never unsee and that you're bowing down to, that you're putting first before God. Uh, maybe it is people or things that we're looking at with our eyes and the lust of the flesh, the pride of life, those types of things. Maybe you might not think anything about it, but it can lead you further away from God to, to a place of compromise. Uh, the, the sounds that we hear, the music that we listen to, oh man, it's just, it really doesn't matter. It's not a big deal. I mean, all, I mean it says a few bad words here and there. I, I, I know it's violence, but no, no, just listen to me. What you're allowing in is going to come out. What you're watching in your eyes is going to, is going to manifest at some point. And, and so it's important for us to just be careful what we watch, what we listen to, what we touch and feel that can lead us down a dangerous road far away from God. Amen? Not, not condemnation. I don't know what you've been watching. I don't know all that. So if you feel like, well, he's been, he knows what I've been doing. No, I don't know. That's the Holy Spirit then, right? So he says, whoever does not fall down and worship will immediately be thrown into a blazing furnace. Oh, in other words, we're going to kill you, okay? And it's not going to be a fun, like, there's no death that's fun, I'm sure. But hey, burning, right? Like, you, you, we're going to throw you in the furnace. So therefore, as soon as they heard the sound, there it is again, they heard the sound of the music, all the nations and the peoples of every language 
fell down and they worshiped this, this image, this idol of gold that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And at this time, at this time when everybody else is kneeling, some astrologers came forward. These are fortune tellers. Now, who all was supposed to bow down to worship the idol? Everybody. But I find it interesting that these guys didn't bow either. But they came to tell on the Jews. They, they, they came to tattletale. And, 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 and they said, uh, oh, may the king live forever. I, I just imagine them talking like that. Oh, may the king live forever. You know, just like kind of sucking up a little bit. He oh, says, uh, <laughs> I don't know why they weren't bowing down to worship, but they weren't. It says, oh, your majesty has issued a decree that everyone who hears the sound of the flute and zither, the lyre and harp and the pipe and all kinds of music must fall down and worship the image of gold. And that whoever does not fall down and worship will be thrown into the blazing furnace. Oh, but there are some Jews whom you've set over the affairs of over the province of Babylon, uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and a, and a billy goat. <laughs> they pay no attention to you, your majesty. Oh. <laughs> they neither serve your gods nor worship the image of gold. That you've set up, and I'm like, come on, well, y'all are y'all aren't bowing down either. What's the deal? Like, and, and here's what I, I want you to get: it. listen to me. Like, listen to this. When you take a stand for God, people are going to come at you. They're going to say things about you you don't like. Oh, you're just a holy roller. Oh, you you're just a goody two shoes. Oh, you're just a better than thou. Right, like, who do you think you are that you don't have to bow down to this? That you, oh, so you, you don't do these things? That makes you better than us, right? Can you, can you kind of see that? So furious with rage, Nebuchadnezzar summons Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men were brought before the king, and Nebuchadnezzar says to him, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods, nor worship the image of gold that I've set up? Like, are, you're dissing me like that? I made a command, and you're supposed to do what I say. You're, you're going against the flow. Like, like, get with the times. Like, you're just being old-fashioned, still serving God that way. I mean, you, you, I mean, look, you're a captive in my country, and you're still going to serve your God? You're just being old-fashioned. Times have changed, right? Like, everybody's doing it. You guys should do it. I don't understand. And so it's this pressure. It's this cultural pressure to bow down. And I love th this next part. Um, well, actually, it's the part after this, but uh, here's what he says in verse 15. When you hear the sound of the horn, the music, if you're ready to fall down and worship the image, good. But if you do not worship it, you'll be thrown immediately into the blazing furnace. Another translation says, I'm going to give you another chance to do what I tell you, tell you, tell you to do. I'm going to give you another chance and look at this pride. Look at this arrogance. He says, then what God will be able to rescue you from my hand? What God can save you from, from me? I'm, I'm the king of the greatest nation on the planet. What, what God can save you from me? And a little pride here, a little arrogance, and he gives them an either or. He gives them a do what I say or die kind of mentality, kind of uh, ultimatum here. And these guys have a choice. We stand firm and we lose our life or we, we give up and we lose our witness. We lose everything that we've worked for. And everybody think we're just a bunch of fakes and frauds. And so in your notes, there's three things I want you to know about standing firm. And the first one is this. Standing firm takes courage. It takes courage. Another way to say it is it takes heart. It, it takes courage. Daniel chapter 3 verse 16 says, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego responded and said, Oh, Nebuchadnezzar, we're not worried about what will happen to us. Do you hear the courage there? Like, hey, we're not worried about what's going to happen to us. The only way they could respond with that attitude is if they had decided in their hearts that, that God was real. 
Because you, you wouldn't give up your life for, for a false god, would you? The only way they could say, oh, we're not worried about it, is they had made up their minds. They were at peace. They had made a decision that God is the only true God. They had made that mind, their minds up. They had peace. And there was a scripture that I came across this past week in my, in my one-year Bible reading from 2 Thessalonians 3.16. I want to share it with you. It says, now may the Lord of peace himself, who's the Lord of peace himself? Jesus is the Lord of peace himself. Now may the Lord of peace himself give you peace, say it with me, at all times and in every way. The Greek for at all times literally means at all times. The Greek for every way literally means every way. So that's why these Hebrew children could stand up in the face of, of Nebuchadnezzar because God had given them peace. They had courage in every situation and at all times. Here's what I'm trying to say to you. You can have peace when you're partying at the palace you can have peace when you're going into the fiery furnace because peace is not a relative term. It's not as if things are going well and so you must have peace and when things are going bad, you don't have peace. You can have peace in the worst times of your life. You can be walking through hell on earth and have the peace of the Lord of peace himself with you every step of the way. That's something we ought to give praise to God about today. We can have his peace. And so they did. They had his peace. They had courage, and, and standing firm takes courage. The second thing about standing firm is that, that it takes faith. It takes faith to stand firm. It takes faith. The story goes on in verse 17, and it says, If we're thrown into the flaming furnace, our God is able to deliver us. He's able. Oh, and he will deliver us. Out of your hand, your majesty. But if he doesn't, please understand, sir. I love, their, I love their kindness to King Nebuchadnezzar. They're not like all up in arms and throwing stuff. And you just need to listen here now. No, it's just like, hey, like if he doesn't rescue us, sir, please understand that, that we will never, under any circumstance, serve your gods or worship the gold statue that you've set up. We won't do it. And I love, I love that. They just, they just, yes, yeah, sir, I'm sorry, we can't do that. We can't, we can't. But we, also, we have no reason to believe God's not going to save us. And, and in verse 19 through 27, then King Nebuchadnezzar was furious. One translation says his face becomes disfigured. He's so angry and so enraged like his face is twisted up in knots because they won't do what he's asked them to do. They won't worship his gods. So he's furious with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and his attitude towards them changes. And he ordered the furnace heated seven times hotter than usual. And he commanded some of the strongest soldiers in his army to tie up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and throw them into the blazing furnace. So these men, wearing robes, turbans, trousers, and other clothes, were bound and thrown into the blazing furnace. The king's command was so urgent and the furnace was so hot that the flames of the fire killed the soldiers. Y'all listen to that. It kills the soldiers who threw them in. And, and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they fall into the fire, firmly tied. They fell into the blazing furnace. And immediately, King Nebuchadnezzar leaps to his feet in amazement. And he asks, Weren't there three men that we threw into the fire? Weren't there three that we tied up and threw into the fire? And they said, uh, certainly, your majesty. Certainly. And, and check this out. He says, look, I see four men loose. Hey, they're not tied up anymore. They're loose walking in the midst of the fire. <laughs> and they're not hurt. The, and the form of the fourth is like the What? Son of God. The form is like the Son of God. This is, what, this is what theologians call a Christophany. There are a few times in Scripture where Jesus leaves heaven, comes to earth for just a moment. And this is one of those moments where he, he shows up. Nebuchadnezzar saw the Messiah. 
He saw the Messiah. And, and there, it's called the pre-incarnate Messiah. It's before Jesus was born. You see, Jesus lived on the earth 33 years, but before and after that, he's always been in heaven, always been with his Father at the right hand, always there. And in these few moments, he left for just a moment to show up and to, and to make a difference, to rescue his people. And verse 26 says, Nebuchadnezzar approached the opening of the blazing furnace. I imagine he's kind of having to creep his way up because it's hot. And, and, he, and he shouted, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, servants of the Most High God. Hey, I believe. Servants of the Most High God. You're not just servants of a God. You're servants of the Most High God, the only God. Are you there? Are you okay? He said, are you, are you okay? Come on, come out. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of the fire and everybody gathered around them. They crowded around them. They saw that the fire had not harmed their bodies, nor was a hair of their heads singed. Their robes were not scorched, and there was no smell of fire on them. <laughs> That's pretty awesome. So the third thing that I want you to get today is that when you stand firm, it inspires others. Nebuchadnezzar is inspired in this moment. The, the, the provincial officials are inspired in this moment. They can't believe what is happening in front of them. And verse 28 says, Nebuchadnezzar says, Praise be to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Hey, I, I checked that box on the connection card. I gave my life to Christ today. I, I just saw the Messiah. I'm a believer. Praise be to the God who sent his angel, talking about Jesus, and rescued his servants. They trusted in him, and they defied my commands. They were willing to give up their lives rather than serve or worship any god except their own. So because these men stood firm, they loved well, Nebuchadnezzar has a life-changing encounter with the Son of God. And now the king sees how great God is. He's a mighty God. He got saved, but he didn't get sanctified because in verse 29, he says, I decree that the people of any nation or language who say anything against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be cut up into pieces and their houses turned into piles of rubble. He was saved, but he wasn't sanctified. He was still working out the anger, working out a little bit of violence, you know. He, he still had some things he was working on, but he said, he said that because there is no other God who can save this way. There's nobody else like our God. Come on, let's give God thanks. There's nobody else like him. And then because they stood firm, they loved well. They didn't compromise. Look what verse 30 says. The king promoted them in the province of Babylon. He gave them more authority. He recognized that the Spirit of God was on them, and he gave them more responsibility because they wouldn't bow down. They stood their ground. They stood firm. So I want to close out with this today. I had this thought earlier in the week that if we're going to stand firm on something, shouldn't we make sure that what we're standing on is firm? Does that make sense to you? If you're going to stand firm on something, you probably ought to make sure that what you're standing on is firm. Because we know what happens to houses that don't have foundations, they crumble. Lives that don't have a foundation, crumble. Relationships that don't have a foundation, they crumble. And so if we're going to build our lives, let's make sure that we build them on the right things. Let's make sure that we build them on the right things. I'll, I'll say it this way. I think we take stands on things that don't really matter. That God, God's concerned about, but it's not his primary concern. He loves us way more. He loves you way more. And so if we're going to build our lives on something, if we're going to stand firm on something, number one, let's stand on the rock. Let's stand on the rock. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. There's another song I love. It says, it, it's, I mean, let me remember the words. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood. And righteousness, 
I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. I lean on Jesus. He's my rock. Psalm chapter 40, verse 2 says, He lifted me out of the slimy pit. Anybody ever been in the slimy pit before? Out of the mud and the mire. He set my feet on the rock, and he gave me a firm place to stand. In other words, I don't know what you're going through. I can't tell you about everything else in life today, but I can tell you this. I can tell you he lifted me up out of the mire and out of the mud and out of the slimy pit, and he gave me a firm foundation to stand on. I can testify to that. That's what he did for me. So if I'm going to stand, I'm going to stand on the rock. I'm going to stand on a firm foundation. Number two, if I'm going to stand, I'm going to stand on God's love. I'm standing on his love. I love that song we sang today. His love never fails. It never gives up. It never runs out on us. His love is eternal. His love goes on and on. His love stands firm. That's what the scripture says in in Psalm 89. It says, I will declare that your love stands firm forever, that you have established your faithfulness in the heaven. If I'm going to stand, I'm not going to stand on my love because my love is conditional. But God's love is not. The, The scripture says it's unconditional love. Do you know what that means? The, the, yeah, it doesn't matter what you do. Here's, here's the best definition I've ever heard. Unconditional love is the fact that he loves you for no good reason. <laughs> you didn't do anything good to cause him to love you. He just loves you unconditionally for no good reason. He loves you. And if I'm going to stand, I'm going to stand on that love, not my love. I'm going to stand on his love. Number three, if I'm going to stand, I'm going to stand on his ways, on God's ways, because his ways are higher than my ways. His thoughts are higher than my thoughts. His ways are not my ways. His thoughts are not my thoughts. Can I get a witness today? I, we, we just don't think a lot. God and I, we just don't, my, my ways are way different than his ways sometimes. But if I'm going to stand, I'm going to stand on his ways because his ways Stand firm. The scripture says in in Psalm 93 that your statutes, your ways, stand firm. Another verse says, the earth and all of its glory will fade, but the word of God will stand. The word will stand. So I'm going to stand number four on his word. I'm standing on God's word. His word is the same yesterday. Today, tomorrow, Tuesday, like 2025, his word is still the same. It never fails. It, it's always there. Scripture says in Psalm 119 that your word is eternal. It goes on. It stands firm in the heavens. It stands firm. And if I'm going to stand, I'm, I'm, I'm just going to stand for God. I just boil it down to that. Number five, I'm going to stand for God. If I stand, I'm going to stand for God. You know, um, the Bible says that if, if we're ashamed of God, if we're ashamed of Jesus, that Jesus would be ashamed of us. And we don't like to think of that. Um, but it's true that if we won't stand up for God on, on this earth, the Scripture says He won't stand up for us in heaven. And in, in fact, in Matthew chapter 10, verse 32, this is the message, paraphrase. It says, Jesus said, stand up for me against world opinion, and I'll stand up for you before my Father in heaven. Here's, here's what I want to hear Jesus say one day. is well done, good and faithful servant. The other thing that Jesus is going to say is, depart from me, I never knew you. I, I never knew you. I'm, I'm ashamed before my Father in heaven. <laughs> the Bible says that, um, that Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father. That's, that's where he is. He's seated at the right hand of the Father. Colossians 3.1 
uh, again in Hebrews and other places, it says he's seated at the right hand of the Father. But I want, I want you to see this. I want you to get this. I hope, you, I hope it fires you up like it did me. So Jesus is seated most of the time. But there's one occasion where he stands. And it's actually um, when Stephen, the very first martyr for the Christian faith, was stoned to death. See, Stephen was standing for his beliefs. He was standing for what he believed to be true. He was standing up for the Christian faith in a culture of compromise, in a culture that said, you better stop or we're going to kill you. And so he wouldn't stop. He wouldn't change his mind. He wouldn't back down. And they stoned him. Some, some just to give you an idea, like, it's one of the most ruthless ways to die. It's been done many different ways. Sometimes they would throw so many rocks at you until you were covered in a, in a heap of rubble. Sometimes they would hold you down and someone would drop a boulder, a large rock on your chest. It's been done a lot of different ways. And this guy is the very first person to lose his life for Christianity. And, and look what he says. He says, full of the Holy Spirit, he looked up to heaven and he saw the glory of God and Jesus standing. <laughs> standing at the right hand of God. And he said, look, I see, the, I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. And here's what I want to close with today. You can write this last statement down. Is it when I stand... Jesus stands with me. When I stand up for what's right, for what I believe in, when I love people well, man, when I'm, when I'm standing firm and loving people well, he's going to stand up with me. And if nobody else stands up with me, he's the only one that matters. He's the only one that matters. Hey, would you bow your heads and close your eyes with me today? And, and let me just lead us in a moment of, a moment of decision, a moment of response. What's the Holy Spirit saying to you today? What's he, what's he whispering in your ear today? And as you think about that, as you let the Holy Spirit speak to you, I'm, I'm just going to pray. That, Lord, I'm praying that you would help us to stand firm in a culture of compromise, in a culture that doesn't believe like we believe, in a culture that says, change your behavior or else, in a culture that is trying to stifle our faith, God, give us courage. Give us heart to stand firm and love people well. Give, give us faith to trust what you say, Lord, to believe that you will come to our defense, that you will be the fourth man in the fire, that you will come to our rescue. Lord, help us to inspire people around us, not by the bold stance that we're taking, but by the love of Christ Jesus that is oozing out of our very lives, the, the fact that we love people like Jesus loved people. God, we, we want to stand firm. We want to love people well, so help us to stand on the rock of our salvation, Jesus Christ. Help us to, to stand in your love that covers a multitude of sins. Lord, help us to stand in your ways because your ways are higher than our ways. We, we, we do some crazy things sometimes, God. Help us to stand in your ways, to stand on your word that is the same yesterday, today, and forever, to stand in the armor of God, to stand with purpose, to stand for you, Lord, to stand for you. And with your head still bowed, worship. We started out today just talking about worship. Worship is our response to what we value most. And maybe you're here today and you're far from God. You don't have a relationship with God. Maybe you're here today and you're a compromising Christian. You believe in Jesus, but you've been compromising. You've been throwing in the towel a lot. Maybe you've been placing more value on things that you can see and hear and touch and feel finding fulfillments in, in things other than God. And you know that your relationship with God's not 
at the level you want it to be. It's not where you want it to be. And so you say, Ben, I want to take a stand today. I'm ready to take a stand for Jesus. This is a private matter between you and God. Next month, you'll have an opportunity for baptism to stand in front of people. But right now, it's just you and God. If you're here today and you say, Ben, I want to take a stand. I want to make Jesus the Lord of my life. I want to invite him to lead me and guide me and direct me. I, I want him to fill my life. I want him to be my Savior and my Lord. I'm ready to stand for him. If that's you, on the count of three, lift up your hand. One, two, three. God bless you. God bless you. Who else? Who else? Just lift your hand. Thank you so much. I'm ready to take a stand. I'm ready to take a stand. Who else? Just lift your hand. Slip it up. Slip it up. God bless you. Thank you. I see you right there. Who else? All right, right where you are, let's say this prayer together. Say, Jesus, I confess you as Lord. Your mighty God, my Savior, my Lord, my best friend. Help me to live my life for you. The best that I know how, I will live for you. Will you forgive my sins? Cleanse me. Give me a fresh start. I serve you today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Come on, let's give God thanks today. Let's praise the mighty God. Amen. Thank you, Lord.